Welcome everyone, thank you for joining on day three of this introduction to App Initio Simulation. Let me introduce today's speaker, Arik Miranda. Arik Miranda is part of the VASP developer team since 2019. He brought a lot of experience in computing electron phonon coupling using the App Init code. So in the past two years, he contributed to VASP by implementing the electron phonon self-energy and transport. Additionally, he's um, maintaining the part of the code to compute Vanier functions and added the k-points opt file. In his talk, he will introduce a very special kind of exchange correlation functionals that is called hybrid functionals. Marik, the stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, I will talk to you about hybrid functionals. Um, you have seen this slide before in maybe two or three talks uh, of this workshop, but it's good to reiterate on it. So if we could, uh, ideally, we would try to solve the many body Schrodinger equation. And the difficulties of doing this have been uh, mentioned before as well, that uh, even if we could solve it, um, the storage demands would be prohibitive. So even for a very coarse sampling, uh, we will need a huge storage. So in practice, this is uh, not done. Um, and the solution for this was already alluded to uh, on the first day, uh, is to map this many body problem to uh, one electron theory. So instead of having a big object that depends on many variables, we have uh, small objects that each function depends on, on one variable, so one function for each uh, electron, uh, depending on the on a single variable. So this is the the idea in uh, Concham DFT that uh, you start you have this um, one electron orbitals. Uh, you define a total energy that is a functional of the density, and uh, it contains uh, these terms. So. Uh, a kinetic term that depends on these orbitals that in turn depend on the density, uh, a potential uh, that is uh, related to, so it's the potential that the electrons see in the ions or an external potential that we can apply to the system. And there is an R3 term that also depends on the density and uh, exchange correlation. The idea is that these terms are functionals of, uh, of the density. So this density can be computed from the one electron orbitals uh, using this uh, approach, so this formula. And um, the one electron orbitals are found by solving the Concham equation. So we can um, um, express these energies in terms of, of potentials and, and the kinetic operator and find uh, the orbitals. Uh, for the electrons. Um, now the issue is, uh, was also alluded to before uh, in the first uh, talk, is that we don't know the exact form of this uh, exchange correlation energy. Uh, so it's defined as the difference between a total energy, so the full uh, interaction, minus the terms that we know. So it's basically everything else. Uh, that we don't know an explicit form for. And uh, this mapping uh, up to here is exact. So if we could find a functional form for the exchange correlation, uh, we, would, we would be able to, to find our total energy exactly. Um, the, this exchange correlation uh, energy potential can be written in terms of the exchange correlation energy with this uh, functional derivative. Uh, now, in practice, uh, we don't know this functional form exactly. So what is done currently uh, normally is to approximate it uh, on, on accurate calculations. So for example, uh, local density approximation is uh, uh, based on, on Monte Carlo calculations from, of the uniform electron gas. And um, now if we want so this, is, this exchange correlation contains both exchange and correlation. Now, we 
know how to compute the exact exchange and uh, there is an explicit form for it that can be obtained if we try to build up uh, oscillator determinant uh, describing the many body with uh, with function that is um, so we take all the one electron orbitals and we build this uh, determinant we compute it and we have uh, the orbitals uh, for, for the many body uh, this uh, automatically makes it so that the wave function fulfills the poly exclusion principle. So for example, for uh, N2, so two, two electrons, we would have uh, this type of, of uh, many body wave function written in terms of one electron orbitals. Uh, and if uh, the wave function one is equal to wave function two, then the many body wave function has to be zero because two electrons cannot be on the same orbital at the same time. That's what Pauli exclusion principle says. Um, additionally, with these ansatz, uh, if we would, uh, uh, we can we can uh, arrive to uh, the Rothan equations, that gives us uh, an explicit form for the exchange part uh, of the um, potential, and this exchange part uh, can be written in terms of the orbitals that we are trying to find. Uh, and it's a non-local object. So it depends on two coordinates, um, R and R prime. So it has this uh, functional form. And this, uh, in this way, we can compute the exact exchange. Um, now, let's compare uh, what uh, I described first and what we have now. Um, so in this anti-functional theory, we try to capture exchange correlation um, as a function of the density. Typically, uh, a semi-local approximation is used, like LDA or GGA. And this uh, functional depends on the charge density. Uh, yeah. And OK, exchange correlation, it, it's a density function. So that is, uh, if we know the charge density at any point, then we can build the the exchange correlation energy and also an exchange correlation potential that we can then use in our equation, find our orbitals self-consistently. Now in R3 fog, uh, we would solve the um, Rothan equation and um, the electron interaction potential, the R3 fog, now it's non-local and depends on the orbitals. Um, so this VXHF that I call here, uh, it includes, uh, the exchange exactly, yeah. But by definition, has no correlation. So we are only capturing exchange here. While here, we have exchange and correlation through this density functional that we don't know how to write. Now, if you want to do R34 calculation in VASP, uh, all you need to do is to set uh, these uh, variables on the INCAR file. You say LHF calc true, so that will run your R34 calculation and you choose the percentage of exact exchange that you want. So one means that it will include this exactly as written in this equation. Uh, you have to set these fractions, uh, fraction of LDA correlation and GGA correlations to zero. I will explain you, uh, it will become clear uh, in a while why, why is this is the case. Uh, now we have this R3 fork theory that describes um, the exchange and um, we would in principle be happy, but there is an issue with that, uh, is that uh, R3 fog is not a complete uh, description of the system. So in particular for uh, a, a homogeneous electron gas, uh, you will have uh, the density of states computed with R3 fog. You, you will have uh, a dip near the Fermi level. So basically you won't have a metal, uh, you have a, a gap. And if you look at the group velocity, you will have a uh, discontinuity at this point. And this happens because um, there is a singularity in the Coulomb potential at Q equals to zero. Uh, that, that is what leads ultimately to this, um, to this uh, divergent behavior. Uh, and the solution for this, so to have a better description of, of this uh, homogeneous electron gas as an example is to introduce screening. Uh, additionally, if we try to do computations with this R3 fork um, for some materials here, um, here for example, here in this in this plot we have uh, the band gaps of, of a certain set of materials. 
Uh, so with DFT, if we compare the experimental band gap with the theoretically computed one, uh, we have always uh, an underestimation. Um, if we do the computation with R3 folk, we have an uh, overestimation of the band gap. So this is still not uh, describing correctly our, our experimental results. So we need uh, to have a better treatment of, of electronic correlation. So we cannot just uh, treat exact exchange we need to treat also the correlation. And that is gonna be important for, for the band gaps, as we can see here, but also for uh, total energies with, uh, with chemical accuracy or uh, atomization from emission energies, reaction barriers that is somehow related to these total energies or Van der Waals interactions. Although I should point out that hybrid functionals are not necessarily the solution uh, for, for this uh, last point. So, the idea then, uh, when, and actually we can, we can when we look at this graph, uh, immediately we get a, an idea of, of what could be done. That is, uh, if this is overestimating, this is underestimating, then why not use a mid, uh, something in between both? And, and that is uh, roughly, very roughly speaking, uh, the idea of hybrid functionals is to take a part um, of exchange, of exact exchange as computed in, in R3 folk here, uh, so here, a certain percentage that is determined by this alpha parameter that can be between uh, zero and one. Another part of exchange that comes from a density functional like we had before. So here I, I write uh, as exchange correlation as uh, two together, but we can separate the exchange part here and the correlation part here. Um, so we will have a part of exact exchange from R3 folk. And uh, the rest that is not exact exchange is determined by the density functional. And the correlation is uh, just from the density function. So again, a function of density. Um, now the question is, uh, what is the percentage? So what is this alpha? Um, what, what do we get from the exchange from the density function? And what do we get from exact exchange? So there are a few recipes to do that. So one of them is uh, PBE zero. And uh, the idea there is to use one fourth of exact exchange from R3 folk and three fourths from uh, uh, exchange from the PBE functional. This uh, ratio of mixture is justified uh, from, from first principles using the adiabatic connection formula. Uh, you can read the details of it uh, on this paper. Now, if you want to do this type of calculation in VASP, ah, and uh, the correlation part comes exclusively from uh, PV functional, so function of the density. If you want to run this calculation in VASP, you just need to set LHF uh, calc true, that will run R3 for calculation. And then the default settings uh, will uh, automatically take care of this uh, ratio of mixtures. Yeah, um, you should have GGA equals to PPE. So this means it will use PDE exchange relation functional. Uh, or if you have, if you are using PBE bot cards, which you should in this case, um, this is set automatically by VASP. Uh, another possible recipe, um, it's uh, using, um, it's the HSE um, functional. And it is uh, very similar to PBE zero. The difference being that uh, the exact exchange from R3 folk, well, the, actually there is a separation between short range and um, long range. And only the short range part is treated with uh, exact exchange from R3 folk. The long range part is treated with a density functional uh, from PBE. So the exchange part is treated with PBE. So this is uh, much faster to evaluate um, than, than, than this here. And still, uh, there is also, uh, there is still this uh, ratio as before of uh, one fourth and three fourths to describe the short range part. So it's not just pure exchange, but also a bit of, um, 
the exchange from PV functional, functional of the density. And uh, this separation between uh, short range and long range is based um, on, on this uh, decomposition of the Coulomb kernel. So that is, uh, we say that one over R, that's the Coulomb kernel, uh, it's a short range part and a long range part. And that is done with this uh, complementary R function and R function. Yeah. And there is a parameter mu that chooses how much goes into short range part and how much goes into the long range part. So again, long range part is uh, evaluated from uh, PV functional. So that's fast to evaluate. It depends only on the, on the density. The short range part, it's limited in space uh, because we say, well, it's short range. So uh, that, that has a nice uh, physical, that has nice advantages in terms of, of computing it. Uh, and I will show you why. Um, this mu parameter, um, it's semi-empirical. So it's chosen, so just yield the uh, optimum optimization energies for molecules in uh, Popol's G2 and one test. Uh, the, the exact details are uh, in these papers. But roughly speaking, when you want to use it in VASP, uh, you set LHF calc true, and you have this HF screen to choose a new parameter, and you can um, you can set uh, set it on, on the incar file. So I here have the two uh, values uh, for HSC03 and then HSC06. Uh, basically, the only difference uh, between these two versions of HSC is the, the screening uh, length. Uh, the, the discussion about why one or the other, it's, it's, it's in this paper, so you can find more about it there. Again, uh, GGA, uh, you should use a PV bot car or set this manually on the in-car file. Um, another recipe is... Um, p 3 uh, functional. Uh, in this case, I, I, I write here explicitly that we have an exchange part and a correlation part. The exchange as uh, a part from R3 fog and a part from um, LDA, so lo lo actually local spin density. The, the details are, are in this paper of this functional. Um, then uh, there is also this um, exchange uh, that is uh, on this paper uh, and the correlation part, uh, there is a part that is from um, local spin density and the other part is from leap. So that's this exchange correlation function. Um, the, the parameters are uh, fitted uh, semi-empirically. So that is basically this um, test of molecules, a uh, set of molecules and uh, the parameters are chosen such that the, um, these quantities are well described by this hybrid function. So optimization energies, electron proton affinities, and ionization potentials. To use this uh, function in VASP, you have to choose uh, GGA B3, that is kind of a magic configuration that will include uh, both the parts uh, from local spin density and this uh, B88 and lip. Uh, and then you have uh, all these um, settings to choose the fraction of exact exchange. Uh, that is in this case 0 0.2, as we can see here, exact exchange A is 0 0.2. And then we have to say what is the fraction of GG exchange and the fraction of GG correlation. Uh, additionally, the fraction of LDA correlation. So we need to set these uh, things in in car file, and um, we are we are good to go to run calculations with B3 lib uh, like the function. Now, in terms of computational aspects, um, the R3 fog total energy uh, is given uh, so by by this formula. Um, well, actually, the contribution to the total energy from R3 fog. And to uh, evaluate this in VASP, uh, there are, it's, this is done by a few steps. So the first one is to look at these two orbitals here uh, and perform um, 
Fourier transform. So this is first done uh, pointwise multiplication. So the wave function for every R point is multiplied. And then uh, there is a Fourier transform to reciprocal space. Then in reciprocal space, the Coulomb potential uh, has a simple uh, representation. Uh, so again, just a pointwise multiplication, we have G here and G here, uh, and we obtain uh, this potential in reciprocal space. Then again, uh, an FFT, but this time two real space. Uh, so we have now a V that depends on R. And if you look uh, at uh, what we have here left is a multiplication of V of R with these two orbitals. So that's, that's what is written here. And uh, we have the contribution from um, one of these pairs of Kn and Qm. Now, for each, uh, to be precise, to, for each K and M, we need to sum over Q and M. So this is uh, quite uh, computationally expensive. So we have the advantage that we can use FFT that uh, has nice scaling properties. But um, depending on, on k, uh, on the number of, of k points that we are using in the calculation, the number of bands, um, scaling uh, at some point, I mean, we will see that it's more uh, in general more expensive than a DFT, a simple DFT calculation. Um, so one detail here that is important is that if uh, we want to speed up a bit the calculation, uh, we can use this setting Breckfog that uh, basically determines uh, how these uh, Fourier transforms will be done. So in which uh, grid? Uh, we know that um, the cutoff, the energy cutoff that we set in the INCAR file uh, determines um, a sphere of G vectors. Uh, and normally, as we've seen on the first uh, talk, um, this uh, set of, of, of uh, G vectors do not have any aliasing. Um, this Fourier transform should be done on, on twice, the, so on a radius that is twice as large as the um, G determined by the cutoff that we set in the input file. Uh, so if we want to do this FFT exactly, we should set a breakfog. Uh, accurate, and we have no aliasing uh, effects in our calculation. But often, uh, it is okay to have some ali aliasing effects. Uh, so setting, for example, Breckfog normal, will speed up these Fourier transforms here. Uh, and in some cases, can uh, you can still get uh, reasonable results. So. Uh, you might consider this depending on the level of accuracy that you require in your calculation. Now, if you really need a very fast calculation, you can use break fast. Um, and in that case, you will have more aliasing. So here it's aliasing, and here it's just less, and here it's none at all. Um, the a general rule is if you want to go, uh, get accurate forces, you should use break normal or accurate for four norms. Uh, you should use Breckfog accurate. So. Now, uh, here I'm not showing anything about uh, the PAW details of uh, how this is done. Uh, it's rather um, elaborate, but you can uh, read about it on, on this publication if you want to know. Uh, so, scaling. Uh, basically, uh, as we've seen before, uh, we need to, to, to compute each contribution of k and n, we need to sum over q and m. So that means, and, and for each, uh, each of these terms that we want, that we compute, we need to do two Fourier transforms. So the scaling will be, um, uh, each Fourier transform scales as NFFT, logarithm of NFFT. And we need to do this for uh, Q and M and K and N. So the total scaling will be uh, number of bands times number of K points, number of bands times number of Q points, and then uh, two, two, two times uh, for the, um, uh, the, the scaling related to the FFT uh, part. Uh, 
to have an idea of all this, what this means in practice in your calculations, the number of bands is roughly proportional to the number of atoms. Uh, the number of FFT points will be related to the volume, um, but of course it depends also on the cutoff energy that you choose. So this is basically the basis that we are using um, in, in a plane wave calculation. Uh, and the NK and NQ in principle scale as one over N atoms, but uh, only up to some point, because once you have um, NQ and NK equals to one, then you, you cannot have this, you don't have this inverse scaling anymore. So um, now another point that uh, I want to talk about is uh, the short range and long range separation. I, I mentioned it before on, on the context of uh, the HSE functional uh, that I, I put here again. Um, so we, we have to separate uh, between a short range and a long range part. Uh, what that amounts to, uh, as I've shown before, is uh, we have a Coulomb kernel, so one over R, short range part and a long range part. Um, in, if we would look at a material, uh, that would basically mean that we have, uh, if we look at the interaction from an orbital that would be here, uh, we would, we can, Considering we should consider interactions within this uh, sphere. So beyond that, that is considered long range. So that enters in another time. Basically, we split our space into short range and long range part. And that makes it that uh, what in initially was uh, our exchange energy like so, now as to have, uh, so if we look at the short range part, it will have this uh, complementary error function truncating the interaction beyond this uh, sphere. Uh, now, if this mu parameter, that is what controls the radius of the sphere, or actually the inverse of mu controls the radius of the sphere um, is zero, then one, one over mu would be uh, infinite. So basically this sphere would be infinitely large and uh, the long range term would be zero. So that means basically, uh, that our short range term would be just this, that, so the complete um, exchange, exact exchange in the full system. Uh, in the other limiting case, uh, if mu is uh, infinity, then one over mu is zero and the short range is zero. So everything would be treated by the long range part. Yeah. So th this is just the two limiting cases, but. In general, we use a mu that uh, is, uh, for example, 0 0.2. So that gives a certain uh, separation of, of space, a certain size of a sphere that where we, inside we have to treat exact exchange and all the rest is treated by our cheap uh, PV functional that depends on the density. Um, now, how does this uh, look? Uh, so one, one can see this uh, in, in, a different, uh, in, a, in a different way, slightly different way, is to think of, um, the, the, of having the, the Coulomb potential as uh, screened somehow by a dielectric function. Um, so this uh, separation between short range and long range, if we would look at uh, V in uh, reciprocal space, it would look somehow like this. And uh, in reciprocal space here, uh, we have a plot of uh, how this function uh, looks like uh, for the HSCO3 uh, and HSCO6. Now, the, this is, if this would be uh, the, the screening of the system, I mean, we can compute the, the screening with RPA. I, I will talk about it in more detail in the next talk. Uh, and this is not really, uh, so the, the exact computation is not exactly what, is not what we are using in practice in our calculation. So uh, this simple separation between short range and long range is not exactly what you would get if you would use uh, an ab initio computed um, dielectric screen. Uh, but there are other ways to, to try to model this screening. So one of them is, for example, uh, tom using a Thomas Fermi screening. So where the separation between short range and long range looks like this in reciprocal space. So we have this parameter mu. 
uh, and uh, VASP internally sets it uh, compute based on, on the valence density of the podcar files and writes it also to the outcar file. So, so you can see um, it's, it's estimated internally in VASP and you can see if this value is uh, adequate for your calculation. Often you might need to change it by hand. Uh, but if you want to use this uh, screening uh, inside VASP, then you just need to set additionally this L Thomas true that will use this model. And uh, with HF screen, uh, you override the mu parameter that was uh, internally determined in, in, in VASP. Now, uh, if you want to be more uh, elaborate, then you can have uh, more. Um, so there are other ways to separate between short range and long range. Um, this was recently proposed in these two uh, papers here. Um, the, no, actually, sorry, the reference here is, is wrong. Uh, it's uh, two entry. So in these two entry papers, there are these two new um, uh, proposals for separation. And uh, this figure is from the uh, first uh, paper. Um, and here you have uh, that the separation between short range and long range is governed by a, a model dielectric function that is written like, like this. And you can use this in VASP by setting uh, L model uh, HF true. So that will use a model dielectric function. And uh, you can use a mu parameter. Um, so you can set again the mu parameter uh, that is here and uh, the percentage of your uh, exact exchange uh, that in this case will be related to uh, your um, macroscopic dielectric constant that you can compute uh, with linear response. Uh, that I will also uh, show in the next um, in the next talk uh, how, how you can compute this. Um, now, if you want more details about this uh, separation, uh, you should read this uh, this publication. So there are different uh, models how to do this, and uh, the results are compared. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the advantages of uh, separating between short range and long range is that um, one can use downsampling. Uh, what does that mean? So let's consider uh, an example. So we have mu uh, equals to 0 0.2. That is this uh, recipe for HSC. Uh, that means that the Coulomb uh, interaction is uh, truncated beyond uh, 2 over mu. So that's around 10 angstrom. Uh, so to capture uh, interaction between an orbital um, up to 10 uh, angstrom distance, uh, we need to consider enough periodic copies, copies of the unit cell to describe it. Yeah. So you can think of it like this. Uh, we, we have a, a unit cell and we take copies of it. We can think of it in real space. So that would be a super cell. So we just take a larger system uh, and we just take uh, copies of it, yeah. So a, a large system with uh, k set to one. So, for example, in this case, I replicate the unit cell five times in each uh, direction. Uh, here it's two D, but in general, you have to think of it in, in three D and how many in which directions you need to replicate your cell. Uh, you can think of it in real space that you have five copies and one k point. But you can also think of it uh, in reciprocal space where you would have one unit cell and five k points in your unit cell. And that is equivalent, it's the same situation. So here the example is for five, but uh, this works for n. Um, and the, the, the point is that uh, you to capture um, your exact exchange, you should include, um, you should have enough copies uh, to, to that you are describing the electrons within this uh, sphere. So if you are describing a short range with the exact exchange, you should have enough uh, k points to, to include all the orbitals within the sphere. Um, same if, uh, so you can think of it in, in, in terms of k points or also uh, of an effective supercell. Now, if the short range, if the, the short range part uh, is somehow smaller, then we can use less um, unit cells. We can use less k points. 
and and that is the main uh, advantage of um, of this HSC uh, functional is that by separating the short range and, and long range part, it allows you to to limit the part that you treat with exact exchange, and the rest, the long range part, you treat it with with the PB uh, functional that is just a functional of the density, and it's very fast to evaluate. Now, in, uh, in practice, what that means is, uh, so if you would want to evaluate your um, uh, energy, exchange energy, um, you choose uh, K points on a 24 by 24 mesh, and uh, Q points, you can choose uh, NQ. And uh, in this figure here, you have uh, different values of NQ. So this NQ are basically reproducing uh, your exchange, exact exchange potential. And you can see is that if you are using HSC functional, you can reduce the, the mesh of Q uh, by quite a bit without affecting the value of your energy. That is not the same for uh, PB0 because uh, PB0 does not do the separation between short range and long range. So that makes it so that you, when you want to do a proposition of PB0, you need to include many more uh, K points and Q points. Um, so reducing the range of this r 3 uh, exchange interaction in the HCC functional allows to represent the FOC potential on a coarser grid of Q points. Um, and that can be done in, in VASP by setting these uh, NK red uh, variables. Uh, this there was some question about this I remember on the previous on, on Monday. Uh, so basically, what this NK red does is uh, reduces the mesh uh, by a certain factor that you can choose. So um, this example here um, on the left, uh, the calculation is done on a twenty-four by twenty-four uh, K mesh, and then NK red of uh, one uh, is used to get this point here. Uh, NK red of two is used to get this point two because uh, NK red two is 24 divided by two, that's 12 and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, with these different values of NK red, we can see all the uh, exchange energy uh, changes. Uh, and of course the advantage of, of using uh, high NK red um, is that your computation will be much faster. You can additionally choose if you want to use uh, all the points or uh, even uh, only. So that's with these uh, logical flags. Ah, the NK red changes uh, is a reduction factor along the three directions, but you can choose individually for each X, Y, or Z direction with these uh, variables here. Mm, now, a word of warning for this uh, you can use down sampling, you can reduce computational costs, but you should always check that you can do it. So uh, there are cases where you can do it and there are cases where, where you cannot. So uh, if you, yeah, so you always have to check uh, basically, or uh, only if you already know that it's that it's okay, then you can use it without without checking. Uh, one example is a loop semiconductor. So if, if you have loop semiconductors, you, you might not be able to use this, um, this down sampling. Um, another thing that I will tell you about is, um, so another trick to reduce computational costs is uh, the adaptively compressed exchange. So the problem, as I mentioned before, is that to apply uh, the R3-FOC, the exact, exact exchange potential to an orbital uh, requires uh, summing over this Q and M. Uh, so that, that makes uh, the whole computation rather expensive. Uh, so each uh, of these that we evaluate implies um, two Fourier transforms uh, for each Q and M to apply to, to any uh, K and N. So we need in general to apply to many K and Ns, so depending on what we, what we have. So this becomes rather expensive. Uh, additionally, within the self-consistency loop, this operation has to be done many times. The solution uh, to, so to reduce the computational cost was proposed by Lin Lin uh, in this paper. Um, and the idea is to build 
an operator uh, that he called ACE that behaves in the same way uh, as the Artrifoc uh, exchange when applied to, to an orbital. Um, but well, not any orbital, actually, only occupied orbitals. And uh, with this restriction of saying that I want to, where he said that he wants to build um, an exchange operator that, that um, reproduces the effect of the, the R3 Fock operator only on an occupied orbital, he was able to build a, a compressed representation of this operator. Uh, I will show you briefly how this is done in practice in VASP. Um, so you, you build the Fock matrix that is basically you apply the R3 Fock potential to an orbital and well, basically you sandwich it between uh, two different orbitals. Uh, you have the Fock matrix. Then you perform a Koleski factorization of this M matrix. Um, then you, uh, using these Ls, uh, you can uh, multiply together with these Ws that are just the effect of uh, uh, the R3 Fock operator on an orbital. You can build these, these vectors and then you store them and you have a compressed representation of your operator. And this is rather fast to, to evaluate um, in, in the code. So you need to work a bit to, to build this operator, but once this is done, you can apply it very easily to any uh, other occupied orbital. So this allows to use um, Davidson diagonalization for, for hybrids. Uh, so that works very roughly like, so uh, you have um, within the self-consistent iteration, you have a set of orbitals, you build your ACE operator. And then you have an, an inner loop where you keep this uh, ACE operator fixed and you can uh, compute uh, wave functions, uh, build a charge density from these wave functions and mix them. So uh, what you put in, uh, what you get out, and you only put a percentage of what came out. Uh, and you can do this inner loop here uh, before then progressing to, to the outer loop. That is the one that you would see uh, in the outcar file um, uh, where you build new orbitals uh, and you have to do this until self-consistency. Uh, self -consistency. Uh, now this is the default in VASP. So uh, if you have VASP6, well, the default in VASP6, I should mention, uh, when compiled with a uh, fork double buffer, the option, so it's a pre-compiled option. If you are not sure if your VASP version was compiled with this or not, you can also just check if uh, when you do an hybrid calculation with the settings that I, I showed before uh, throughout the slides, uh, if you get DAV uh, in the SCF loop. So then you will know that we are, you are using Davidson diagonalization that is done with this uh, variable set of truth. So this is the default if um, precompiler option is set. And this can save you about the factor of three in, in computational time. So it's, it's uh, very nice to, to, if you want to do computation with every functions. Uh, now I will talk to you about some uh, numeric results. Uh, some atomization energies, well, I will just go through, through them. So one example here is the computation of atomization energies of small molecules. Um, this is a comparison between um, experimental. So the black and red lines are a comparison of um, the atomization energies of some small molecules that are here, so these small molecules. Um, a comparison between the results for the atomization energies computed with PBE uh, compared with, an exper with the experiments. And the red line is with PB0, so hybrid function. And what you can see, well, if the, the deviation is smaller, means that we are closer to the experimental result. And what we can see is that for all these molecules, or most of them, the, the description with PB0 is uh, closer to the experimental uh, uh, one. Uh, there is, so there is a significant improvement um, 
over the DFT description of uh, atomization energies uh, compared to the experiments. Uh, these other two lines, the, the green and the blue, is a uh, comparison uh, with another code, uh, Gaussian, which is Gaussian go um, orbitals. Um, and you see that um, the, the, the results pretty much agree. So using uh, PAW formalism or Gaussian, you can get the same, the same results. So it means also that uh, experimental results might not, so the PV0 results might not be on top of experiment, but uh, this might uh, in fact be a limitation more of PV0 itself than, than a limitation of the theory than, than necessarily a, an issue in the code. So. Uh, so another example is a uh, computation of, of lattice constants and bulk moduli uh, the, for uh, different uh, solids. Um, so the PB0 overall uh, improves the description of these lattice constants and the bulk modules. That can be seen, for example, here, where, where there is uh, the mean relative error or mean uh, absolute relative error comparing uh, from um, PV to PV0, we see that this error decreases. Um, so we, we is basically closer to, to, to the experimental uh, results. Uh, interesting to see is that uh, using HSC, that is computationally advantageous, as, as I've showed you, uh, hopefully convinced you, the, this separation between short range and long range um, allows you to get a more efficient uh, computation or a faster computation. And the results are still uh, good uh, for lattice constants, for example. Slightly worse, but not so bad. Uh, and still better than PV. Uh, same for bulk modules. Uh, now for B3lib, uh, it's not so good. So um, for bulk modules and even lattice constants, uh, it's uh, comparable or, or worse than PV. Um, so that's, that's, yeah. For uh, the band gap, um, again, a comparison between PB uh, and uh, the hybrid function. So if you remember the first plot, uh, one of the first plots on this presentation, uh, we were hoping hybrid functions will bring uh, something in between, uh, between uh, DFT values and, and the R3 fog values that were overestimated. Uh, and indeed, that's that's what happens. So hybrid functions tend to to give a better um, uh, estimation of of the band gap. Um, well, we've seen before that the structural part uh, is also better described by these hybrid functions. Mm, for uh, large gap materials, though. Uh, the gap is still underestimated. So for a very large gap, like we see here, lithium fluoride, argon, new, um, the, the gap is still underestimated. Um, another example is uh, atomization energies. Um, so in general, um, the description is better except for um, uh, metals. So uh, in, in the case of metals, you get really a, a wrong description of, of atomization energies. Yeah. Um, this is mainly, this is uh, discussed in detail in, the, in this publication. So if you want to look, uh, if you want to have um, access to more details, I recommend to, to have a look here. Um, so this is again, the same thing. Um, uh, it really uh, fails in, in the description. So the description of atomization energies um, can be worse than, than a PV function uh, for, for metals. Mm. So I will just skip this. So that is because, uh, so bit really overestimates the exchange correlation for localized electrons and it also fails to describe uh, this free electron-like behavior. That is because of this leap part. Uh, that was mixed in, in Bitrelib. Again, for a discussion, I recommend this, this publication. Um, for it, its of formation, um, are uh, using uh, the hybrid functionals, uh, in general, we obtain better agreement with, with experimental results. Uh, 
So in PB uh, would be these black bars. We see that the, the error is much larger than if we use uh, PB0 um, or HSC uh, or even B3D. Uh, here is another example. Um, so that's the competition uh, for the transition metal monoxides. Um, I will show, for example, that uh, the lattice constants are better uh, described uh, comparing LDA with an hybrid functional. So, well, comparing LDA, hybrid function, and experimental data. You can see that the hybrid functional. Um, very closely um, matches with the experimental uh, results. And that is also the case for, for the magnetic moments uh, and the band gaps. Yeah. So overall, there is, there is a better uh, agreement um, with experiment uh, for, for these uh, transitional metal monoxides. Uh, now, uh, another example is um, uh, CO molecules, so carbon monoxide uh, absorption on the metal surfaces. Um, in this case, uh, the, it is uh, it was shown in this, in this uh, publication. So this is basically already a, a collection of published results where uh, it was observed that um, DFT uh, incorrectly predicts where the CO molecule uh, attaches in in um, metal surface. So in particular here, it's uh, talking about uh, the CO molecule in platinum. Um, and almost all across the board, uh, DFT predictions uh, tend to favor this configuration where a molecule attaches on the holocyte. Uh, while what is observed in the experiment is that it attaches on the top side. And this, this is actually a, a, an example of um, an interesting application. Uh, so this, uh, this is, for example, what occurs in uh, catalytic converters in, in cars, uh, where you have a metal surface uh, and you want to remove some of the CO from the exhaust gases, uh, so to make your car a bit more uh, environmental friendly. Um, and uh, so it's it's an interesting application, and it's an application where DFT is failing. So that's that's really a puzzle. Yeah? So DFT that seems that's so promising fails on, on an actual uh, system of interest. Um, now the reasons for that are discussed here. So a possible possible that is uh, that the, the uh, wrong description of the homo of the CO molecule with DFT. Uh, with respect to the Fermi level of the metal. And uh, the hope, uh, there was so then some, some work here uh, in these two papers, two publications. The hope was that uh, doing uh, hybrid functional calculations would um, predict uh, a correct, um, the correct location where the CO molecule attaches to the metal. Uh, that would reproduce the experiment. Uh, and so that was, uh, so here uh, showing the, the, the negative absorption energy. So the absorption energy here, you have to see all this uh, with, a, with a minus sign. So basically um, higher energy will mean the, that is the most stable one. Um, for um, copper, uh, so for um, carbon monoxide on, on copper, uh, done with PBE uh, and two hybrid functionals. And uh, here is the uh, absorption energy. So hit all of this with a minus sign. And the higher, uh, it's more stable one. So um, the, the yeah, higher because it's a negative sign. So uh, what happens here is that then uh, with these hybrid functionals calculations, um, the, um, the correct, uh, so the, the, the prediction is that the CO molecule attaches on the top configuration. So that is good, that's a good sign. And same happens to rhodium, so CO molecule on rhodium. But unfortunately for uh, platinum, that was actually the, the topic of this uh, paper here, um, still um, it doesn't work. So basically still predicts uh, 
the holocyte as the preferable one. Uh, and so that is um, a bit unfortunate, but uh, so while these hybrid functions seem to work for these two um, metals, so the, the, the attaching of this molecule with these two metals, uh, copper and, and rhodium, doesn't work for, for platinum. Uh, and in all of these cases, uh, the absorption energy is still overestimated uh, when compared to the experiment. Uh, so what happens here, very roughly speaking, is that um, what seems to be happening is that uh, the hybrid function is improving the description of, of the molecular orbital, which is shifted upward. So that's that's uh, what was uh, what the, where the FT failed. Uh, but on the other hand, when describing the metal, uh, it fails. So it downshifts the metal copper states uh, and there is um, no shift of these states. But overall, and, and the main issue perhaps is that there is an overestimation of the um, the metallic uh, width. So the, the bands are kind of more spread, which counters then this shift of the, the CO molecule. In short, uh, the hybrid function improves the description of the CO molecule, but worsens the description of the metal. And so that makes it that it doesn't uh, always work as, uh, across the board. Um, this problem then can uh, be solved, uh, for example, with a RPA calculation, which will be the topic of uh, tomorrow, I believe. Uh, you can follow this publication where this is discussed. Uh, so for conclusions, um, hybrid functionals combine the DFT, uh, so an exchange correlation functional of the density uh, with exact exchange. So we take a percentage of, of the, ex the exchange correlation from uh, density functional theory and exact exchange from R3 focal. This is uh, more computationally expensive than just a pure DFT calculation because now we know our potential depends on the orbitals and it's non-local. But we also discussed uh, different ways to improve um, to speed up these calculations. So one of them is doing this short and long range separation. So this uh, allows you to reduce the amount of uh, cue points that are used to describe this potential. Uh, that in turn allows you to do uh, down sampling. So meaning um, sample the, the um, use a K grid denser than Q. Um, and obtain um, accurate uh, exchange, uh, exact uh, exchange energies um, at a lower computational cost. Uh, and finally, the other the other strategy to to speed up the calculation is to use uh, adaptively compressed exchange um, that accelerates the application of this uh, non-local potential to to occupy the orbitals, uh, so that. This basically, I mean, for, uh, for occupied orbitals is what you need for um, a description of total energies, of forces, and stresses, and so on. Uh, and in terms of, of results, uh, so overall, using every functions leads to a better, uh, so to an, to an improvement over semi-local uh, density function theory for molecular systems. Uh, but also of structural properties like lattice constants and block moduli, um, as well as band gap for systems with a small and medium size gap. So for large, for systems with large gap, um, hybrid functions are not, not, not enough. So that you will also see in the next, uh, in the talk tomorrow, uh, that you have to go beyond uh, hybrid functions. You have to use perhaps uh, GW calculations. Um, so, and uh, also beyond uh, what hybrid functions offer, you can uh, go uh, and do uh, RPA calculations, which are uh, more expensive, of course. So that concludes um, the part, uh, the main part of um, of the talk. But uh, I've seen on Monday also that there were some questions about uh, K points and computation of band structures. Uh, Martin has explained most of it. Uh, I will just refresh it here. Uh, 
in the short time that we have left. Um, so if we want to do a band structure calculation with DFT, uh, we, fo we can follow this procedure. We do a calculation with K points with a regular K point mesh, uh, do a self consistent calculation. And then we do a non self consistent calculation. We set I charge to 11, that will read the charge car file. And then we'll do a computation of um, the orbitals along the path specified by a new K points file. So we have to do two runs of VASP, one to produce a charge car file, and second run, a non self consistent run that will read this K points file along the path and do the computation of the eigenvalues. Yeah? This will be written to VASP run XML or HDF5 file, or even on the opt car, you get the eigenvalues there. Uh, so this is a standard procedure for DFT, but uh, you've seen uh, during this talk that hybrids are a bit more complicated because uh, now you have a potential that is described by the orbitals. Uh, so you need to have this uh, potential well described and that has to be done using a regular grid. So the standard procedure that is recommended uh, on, on the documentation of VASP, uh, mostly up to now, is the following. You start, you do a standard DFT calculation uh, with a uniform K-point mesh, like so. You copy the irreducible Berlusone K-point uh, K points file to K-points. So you, you copy this file that's produced by this VASP run to a K-points file that contains, will contain this uh, top part here. And then you add an explicit list of K points along the path that you want to do the computation of your band structure and you set the weight to zero. What this will do internally in VASP is simple, is that the exchange part will be computed with the orbitals on these K points because they have a certain weight uh, and this points will not enter here because the weight is set to zero, but they will be used um, when solving this uh, whole thing equation. So we will get uh, the values, uh, you will get orbitals and you will get energies um, for the orbitals uh, along this, this uh, new set of points that you chose. So the difficulty, and this is a bit cumbersome because you have to co copy this K points file to another K points file and then add a list of points. And this is because you need to describe this, um, this potential that is dependent on the orbitals. So uh, you, you basically have, have to, to, to do it uh, in this way uh, up to now. So the new procedure that we implemented is uh, a bit different. It's just that you can do it all in one single calculation. So you set, you say you want to do an hybrid calculation. Um, you set your uniform uh, K-point mesh like you used to do for a standard DFT calculation. And then you specify uh, an additional file that is called K-points opt, where you can specify the path along which you want to compute your uh, band structure. So if you have, uh, VASPRAN with these two files, uh, and you can do hybrid calculations or even standard DFT or whatever you want. Uh, it will do, VASP will do a self consistent, self -consistent calculation on this uh, set of orbitals. And then additionally, we'll compute uh, these new orbitals specified on this path um, using the orbitals uh, from here to describe the exchange, uh, the Fock exchange potential. Uh, so this will um, simplify. Just a uh, ten minutes flow. reminder. Yeah. Um, so this, in principle, uh, simplifies a bit over over the, this type of um, workflow that that uh, we recommended before. Mm. And again, the eigenvalues you can read from uh, Vasperan or the HDF5 file. And during the tutorials, you will see. Um, you will have examples uh, where this file is used. Uh, just as an extra step that you can, I mean, uh, an extra possibility is to do a band structure with uh, Vanier. Yeah? So you can still use uh, Vanier 90. Uh, you do just a standard DFT calculation on a regular K-point mesh. Um, then uh, you can set an in-car like so. Uh, this is, for example, silicon. 
you, you, you set the number of orbitals in the input file and you said uh, you can actually now um, specify the content of this Vanier 90 VIN file uh, inside the INCAR file itself. So uh, you, you specify your projections to Vanier 90 and um, VAS will run uh, the calculation and call uh, either call Vanier 90 uh, with if you put a library mode, that means L Vanier 90 run to set to true or standalone. That means that you will produce these AMN files and MMN files, and then you can run Vanier 90 afterwards. Um, and then you can you can use uh, Vanier itself as uh, Vanier 90 itself as uh, some plotting features that you can then use with XM Grace or group plot. Um, yeah, so this, this still you can use, but of course here you have a bit, it's a bit more complicated because you have to specify this uh, uh, projections and this requires some chemical uh, intuition and disentanglement windows. So that, that's not so automatic. Here if it's really straightforward, you just need to in, in, uh, add this file and you will get your, your results. And uh, yeah, so that's, that, that's it for my talk. Thank you for the great talk. So this uh, overview of different hybrid functionals that are implemented and available in, in VASP. Maybe could you uh, comment on um, how to choose which hybrid functionals to use? So which hybrid functional, depending on the system that I have, are there maybe some properties of hybrid functionals that um, are convenient yeah. for some systems? Yeah, I, I tried to show some numeric results in the last part of the talk. Um, and you can get an idea that for some certain properties, uh, some hybrid functions are good, some others uh, are not. Uh, so for example, if you want to describe metals, perhaps B3 lip is not, not gonna be the best uh, one, but we've also seen that here, um, the hybrid function is not uh, so good to describe the the, the metals. So it, it's I I fear that is not a, a easy prescription that that can be given. Um, you can try to see uh, from these um, publications that I mentioned. Uh, so here uh, you can see some examples of applications of hybrid functionals and. Uh, what mm -hmm. are the outcomes and what are the, the shortcomings? Of yeah. It? Yeah. That should help. Um, and how about when I have uh, vacancies in the system? Um, um, how can we um, use a different um, mu so to separate the short uh, range and long range terms from each other? Is that uh, something to consider for systems with vacancies? Uh, in principle, yes. So if you have, um, I mean, if you run uh, HSC functional, you will always have this separation between short range and, and long range. Uh, or, I mean, of course, you can always tune the mu, but uh, with HSC, there is also prescribed mu that you that you are recommended to use. Uh, this is 0 0.2 inverse angstrom. Um, so if you want to use to do a uh, calculation of vacancies with, with a HSC functional, you will have this separation between uh, short range and long range. And, and that in principle is okay. So you, you, of course you always have to check, but um, it, it is okay because uh, your interaction uh, is limited in space as well. So an orbital from, from say your vacancy has also a certain range uh, to which it, it can interact. It doesn't extend to, to infinity necessarily. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we uh, go on to the to the next uh, question uh, question from the audience. Uh, can you provide a more uh, quantitative picture of how computational expensive hybrid functionals are? So. Uh, preferably also compare different hybrid functionals as well with respect to PBE. Hmm. Uh, th there are many things uh, entering into it. So um, at some point I should... Um, this is, I think this is the best way to 
to represent scaling without uh, well okay well this says the scaling it doesn't say all the factor the prefactor what it's going to be um but without misrepresenting uh, this this would be the the best um, orientation so what will uh, affect the cost of your computation is the number of uh, k points uh, and q points i mean this distinction uh, by default doesn't exist so if you start an hybrid functional calculation with a regular grid uh, k is equal to q you it only becomes different when you use uh, this uh, nk red uh, variable that i showed um, in the down sampling part so here um, only when you have nk red, you, you, you distinguish between the two and you can have a coarser q than k. Uh, but the scaling then is, is this one. Uh, if you want an idea of how much, uh, how, how much expensive, it, it will depend on, on the calculation that you are doing. Um, how many? So, um, uh, depend on the calculation that you are doing. And um, yeah, it will depend on the calculation that you are doing and um, the number of K points that you have. But let's say for a small system, uh, there's of two atoms, maybe you get a, I don't know, a factor of 10 uh, slower mm -hmm. when you're doing an hybrid yeah. uh, functional calculation. So it's really difficult to say because there is a scaling, it depends on, on the system, but I think this is a good starting point to consider the, the scaling behavior. So let us uh, rush through the, the next question. So there's uh, one question whether how to use the k-opt file. Uh, can it also be used for normal um, band structure calculations? So with I charge 11 and L orbit 11? Yes. That's a quick one, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, great. Then um, there is a more almost uh, yeah question that goes into a philosophical uh, discussion. So is it necessary to tune the mu parameter uh, to match the experimental gap? Or should, shall we always stay um, first principle? <laughs> That's that's an interesting question. Yes, uh, it's, it's a it's a good question. I, I like it. It's uh, this is this depends really on on what what you want to do. Uh, I mean, if you if you know the experimental value already, uh, yeah, of course you can tune mu to get the experimental value. But is this going to be useful uh, for predicting uh, something that you don't have the experimental value for? Maybe not so much. So, but it might be a situation where uh, you know the experimental value and you want your calculation to agree with that so that then you can predict something else. So in that case, I would say that it, it does make sense to tune mu until it fits your experimental gap. So if you have a system and you have access to some experimental uh, measurements uh, that you know what they are uh, and uh, you want to simulate it to predict another property that you don't have access to experimentally i think it does make sense that you to mu to get the, the the agreement with the experiment that you have um, and then you try to predict the other uh, property mm -hmm. but but we should know that we are not adding physics by tuning this parameter so and that is yeah, the yeah. the point that i tried to make at the end last slide is that or well, with the, with all the numeric results in general is that um, you see that there are shortcomings to hybrid functionals. They are not uh, the the final answer. So mm -hmm. you might need to go beyond this hybrid function. You might have to do RPA calculation. You might have to do GW calculations. Yeah. But, Great. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. That's, uh, I think, a uh, good food for thought uh, for the break. Uh, thank you very much for your nice talk and answering questions from the audience. Okay.